Welcome back to Would You Believe Session 4 of our classes on 1 Corinthians. I'm very, very glad that you are here with us today. Whether you are watching this uh, live or later, I'm really glad that you're here. Um, you can find the previous three of our sessions right here where you found this on mostly via our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you're just catching this for the first time, I encourage you to go back and watch the first three if you like, or if you have a particular interest in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 through 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, you've come to the right place. Uh, as always, I'll remind you that what we've been doing here is uh, the readings that you can find in our daily office lectionary uh, from this past week. Uh, if you were watching this on um, Wednesday, uh, March the 30th, um, you will have read the passage that we'll study at the end of our um, time today from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Shockingly, not all of the verses that are um, in this scope, 9 to 1 to 12 to 11, are in the Daily Office Lectionary, but us being the Bible champions that we are, we're going to read them all. So uh, with that, I invite you to get out your Bible a printed Bible, you know, is my favorite, or you can look at it on a Bible browser online, or if you have a printout, however you do it, get God's word in front of you, and let's begin, shall we? Uh, I'm going to take this in some sections, as I always do. Uh, so let's begin, shall we, with um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, and uh, I'll begin by just reading the first six verses, okay? Here we go. Paul writes, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to our food and drink? Do we not have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Okay, let's go back and remember the context in which Paul is uh, speaking and writing, right? Remember that he has received word from the church in Corinth uh, and reports about some discord amongst the church in the church. And, um, and particularly in the topic that we just left was all about um, food eating food that has been sacrificed to idols, whether or not that's okay or not. And uh, we'll pick up this theme again in the coming chapter. Uh, but Paul's basic point here is that um, love is more important than liberty. And he's saying, and, and, and he's basically saying in this, in this group of readings we've been reading here, at the end of chapter 8 and the beginning of verse 9, he's talking about being considerate. Uh, Paul is saying, do you see in these first six verses, that he has rights. He has rights um, to be married. He has rights to earn a living. He says, do we not have right uh, to our food and drink? Do we not have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife? Uh, but Paul, what Paul is saying is he's not going to insist upon his rights. Uh at the risk of having people question his motives. Because for him, what is most important is being an apostle and uh, teaching uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that people can receive him. That's the most principal thing to him. In the context of this, he's, remember, teaching the church to be considerate. Let's look at the next bit, chapter, uh, verse 7 to verse uh, 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Who at any time pays the expenses for doing military service? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not get any of its milk? Do I say this on human authority? Does not the law also say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Or does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was indeed written for our sake, for whoever plows should plow in hope, and whoever threshes should thresh in hope of a share in the crop. 
If we have sown spiritual good among you, is it too much if we reap your material benefits? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we still more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in what is sacrificed on the altar? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Okay, uh, Paul here takes up this sticky topic of, you know, compensation for his work in ministry. What level of financial support does Paul have a right to? Uh, and he's, he makes the argument that, yes, he has a right to be compensated for the work that he does uh, for three basic reasons. The first is that it's just a natural law of civilized society that if you work, you should get paid. Look at verse seven. If you're in the military, you get paid. If you're a farmer, you get to eat the fruit. If you're a shepherd, you get to have milk. Uh, so this is logical. This is what should make sense. The second reason why he's uh, eligible for financial support is because of the law of Moses. Look at verse nine. For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. He's saying, hey, if a working animal is allowed to eat as he goes, how much more should a minister of the gospel be able to be supported and, you know, eat as they go, be provided for as they go? Um, the third reason you can find down in verse 14. He goes, in the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. That's the third reason that Jesus says uh, that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Uh, society, the law of Moses, and the Lord commands uh, that Paul has the right to be uh, compensated as an apostle. He's making this argument because certainly this is a topic of concern that's come up amongst the church in Corinth. Imagine that, a church wondering about clergy compensation. Ha! Uh, so Paul makes a, a brilliant argument here uh, and one that is good for us to know. Look at, let's go on to verse uh, 15. Let's read through verse 18. Paul says, But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing this so that they may be applied in my case. Indeed, I would rather die than that. No one will deprive me of my ground for boasting. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as to make full use of my rights in the gospel." Man, as a pastor, I love these passages. Um, Paul is saying that because he's an apostle, he's laying down his rights, his rights to be rich, his rights to be compensated, or even sometimes respected. He's saying because the most important thing is uh, the proclamation of the gospel for him. Why does Paul lay down his rights? The first reason is look at verse 15 to 18, uh, his calling. This is what we just read. Uh, in verses 19 to 23, he talks about, we'll see, um, the evangelistic passion that he has to share the gospel. And the third reason why he lays down his rights is for his own self-discipline. But let's go back quickly and look at this sense of calling that he has. He's saying in verse 16, Woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. He's saying, uh, whether I get rewarded for this in this world or not, I must do this. Verse 18, he goes, well, then what is my reward uh, for all this work I'm doing? He says this, and man, I love this, that I may make the gospel free of charge. Yes. You shouldn't have to pay to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let the church say, amen. I believe this, right? Now let's look at the next point why he lays down his rights. Uh, 
his passion to evangelize, verses 19 to 23. Here we go. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Wow. Uh, he's saying, let go back at verse 19. I am free with respect to all. However, do you see, I've made myself a slave. What's going on there? Paul is saying, in Christ Jesus, I am free. So are you. I'm free in Christ. But even though I'm free, I'm taking on constraints in order to share Christ. What are the constraints that Paul is taking on? He goes, to the Jew, I became like a Jew. To those outside the law, I became outside the law. For those who are weak, I became weak. So that whoever, whatever, whatever I've got to do to win you, that's who I'll be, he says. He's not talking about being uh, hypocritical or anything. He's just saying, I have all this freedom in Jesus. He says, but I'm laying it down in exchange for, for, for the ability to come alongside someone and, and, be, and be able to explain to them and share with them the gospel of Christ in a way that they can understand. Verse 22, I have become all things to all people, he says, that I might by all means save some. Love this. Uh, I found this to be true in my own ministry. I cannot make myself completely unlike the people in our mission field. You know, there's all sorts of different kinds of folks that live in San Antonio. So should I only be able to talk to, administer, and reach one sort of person? No, right? Uh, you have to be flexible. And I love the idea of, of, of making myself a slave. He says, I, I'm willing to be, to be bound to someone else so that I can see the world through their eyes that I might share the gospel. This is what he means. Let's close chapter 9 by looking at verses 24 to 27. Here we go. Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? And such a run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air. But I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. This is the third reason why he's laying down his rights, for his own self-discipline. He uses the example of an athlete who exercises self-control in all things. Like A great example of this today is this guy, Tom Brady, who's like 40-something years old, but he like is incredibly self-disciplined in his exercise and uh, eating regimen. Uh, like Tom Brady says, I, I have to adopt that sort of discipline. Why? Uh, so that I do not run aimlessly, verse 26. Uh, he says, verse 27, I punish my body and enslave it. Uh, he says, I'm, I'm, I, I'm adopting incredible self-discipline. I'm not going to flaunt again my liberties that I have in Christ. So that after proclaiming to others, I should not be disqualified. Like an athlete is disqualified for breaking the rules. Uh, Paul says, I'm, I'm running this race of being an apostle of Jesus Christ uh, so that I can win it. And by winning, he clearly doesn't mean here, right, financial success or any sort of worldly success. Uh, uh, the plain meaning of chapter 9 says that. What what does it mean winning? What's Paul's definition of winning? Um, winning means bringing souls to the Lord Jesus Christ, like um, uh, saving some, uh, letting people know and see uh, the grace and love of God in Christ. 
Because whatever I've got to do to do that, Paul says, that's what I'm about with self-discipline. Chapter 9, in the books. We did it in 15 minutes flat. Well done, everybody. Let's move on to the sticky wicket. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you dare. If you dare, let us look at it together, shall we? Uh, no, actually, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is about the Lord's Supper. Chapter 11 is the sticky wicket. We'll get there in a second. On to chapter 10. we got to hurry because we've got a lot of ground uh, to cover, and I, I don't want to keep you too long today. <coughs> Let us look at, um, uh, shall we, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's go to um, chapter verses 1 to 13. Here we go. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. All these things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you are standing, so if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. An amazing passage um, with a little bit of Old Testament history and about overcoming temptation a great reading for the season of Lent. Clearly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is reminding the readers of the great story of Moses and Israel in the desert after having crossed the Red Sea. Uh, there's these um, pictures and like foreshadowing of the work of Jesus uh, and how what Moses and the people of Israel went through is kind of like our relationship to Jesus today. Verse 1, all were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. That's a picture of baptism. Like they crossed through the rivers of the uh, the waters of the Red Sea, we uh, have crossed through the waters of baptism. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Verse 2. Verse 3, uh, overtones of the Lord's Supper. All ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. Food and drink, that's the Lord's Supper. Talking about manna in uh, the wilderness and water from the rock in the desert. And what Paul is saying, do you see, in verses uh, 4 uh, and 5, is he points to Christ being with them in the wilderness. So how was that? It was before Jesus was born. But we know that Jesus wasn't, like, made. He was incarnate, right? Uh, he's God incarnate uh, when he was born. So did Jesus exist before his birth? Of course. And what Paul is saying here is that they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So, like, the presence of Christ was with the people of Israel out in the desert. Uh, uh, and that water, like, never failed them. Uh, Jesus called himself uh, um, the river, these rivers of life that will come forth. He is, he is uh, drink indeed. Um, come to me, all you who thirst. Uh, so, like, the Water in the wilderness fed Israel, uh, the water of Christ feeds and quenches our thirst, right? Verse 6, it turns to this idea of temptation and sin uh, and how all what Israel went through in the wilderness. And he tells the story in verses like 6 through 13, right? These stories of Israel's disobedience in the wilderness and how it ended in their death. Paul is saying sin absolutely leads to destruction in this life. Uh, we aren't um, 
we're not supposed to sin. Why? Because we need to fear God's judgment? No, we're saved by grace, not by keeping the law. But what Paul's saying is sin does have bad results for us. And he says, um, and all these things, he says, verse 6, were written down so that we may not desire evil as they did. That's the problem for Paul, uh, the desiring of evil, that thing in your heart that turns and wants to do bad, wants to be bad. Verse 11, look down at there. These things happen to them who serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of ages have come. This is amazing. What does Paul mean by that? On whom the ends of ages have come. Uh, he's saying the, ages, the end of the ages have come upon us, on you, Corinthian church, and on us too that are living today. Why? Because we are in between the coming of the kingdom of God in Jesus, his first coming and his second coming. Uh, he will come again to judge uh, the living and the dead. So we're in this like in between time here. And what happened before the first coming of Jesus with Moses and the people of Israel in uh, the desert, this was written down to instruct us uh, so that we can learn. He's saying in verse 12, a great word. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. Don't have too much confidence in your own sense of morality, right? Lent is a good f correction for us, for us to say, you know what? Don't look now, but I kind of think I have it all pretty well together. Paul's saying, stay on your guard. Uh, if you think you're standing, watch out that you do not fall. Uh, because temptation comes at us, doesn't it? Verse 13, he says, but... The thing about temptation and testing is that nothing has ever come on you that hasn't come on anyone else. Like whatever you're going through, whatever temptation you're facing, uh, you're not special in it. It's common to everyone. But coming with that kind of humbling <laughs> remark that we shouldn't make more of ourselves than we ought to, comes a real encouragement that God is faithful and he won't let you be tested beyond your strength. Um, that is a real encouragement. Uh, uh, look at the end of verse 13. Uh, but with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. I love that. Uh, think about something that might tempt you. You have the ability, my friend, to say no to it. Right? God's always, anytime you're tempted, God's going to give you the chance, the way out. Uh, and there's a difference between the testing that God gives us and the testing that the devil gives us. The devil tempts us so that he can destroy us and bring us down. <clears throat> God, right, and God, our temptations, our testings are to make us stronger, to let us know that he is able to um, strengthen us and help us overcome anything that comes at us. Right, verse 14 to verse 22. Let's look at that. Therefore, my dear friends, free from the worship of idols, I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices partners in the altar? What do I imply then? That food sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what, God, that what pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be partners with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or are we provoking the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? What's going on here? What's Paul, what is Paul talking about here? Clearly, he's beginning to introduce the theme and topic of the Lord's Supper. And when we, when we share in the blood of Christ, verse 11, the, when we break the bread and we share in the body of Christ, who is it that we're fellowshipping with? We're fellowshipping with Christ in the Lord's Supper. Okay? <clears throat> and remember, what's one of the issues in the church in Corinth? Food sacrificed to idols. He's going back to that topic. Right? And he goes, look at, at uh, um, verse 20. 
Uh, what pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be partners with demons. So he's saying to eat of this food sacrificed to idols in a way that the pagans do it and participating in the ritual, right? Um, so that is fellowship with demons. What Paul is saying is, please don't go have the Lord's Supper at church and then go to a pagan temple and eat and go to one of their, uh, you know, food eating parties over there. It says, you cannot partake at the table of the Lord and the table of demons, Paul is saying. He removes that ability to do that. And look, look at verse 22. Are we provoking the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Um, it's like confronting God. And I encourage you uh, for, for extra points in your Bible study. Uh, what he is doing here in verses 21 and 22 is quoting the great song of Moses from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 16 and 17. Uh, you can pause the video, go check and read that. And um, this is what Moses was calling out in Israel, this very thing. And again, he's hearkening back to Moses and um, the people of Israel in, uh, um, in the wilderness. Just like they um, left God to do pagan worship because they were losing their faith. He says, we shouldn't do it either. Don't provoke the Lord to jealousy. Verses 23 to, let's do uh, through chapter 11, verse 1, okay? Here's the next passage. Uh, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth and its fullness are the Lord's. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the grounds of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, out of consideration for the one who informed you, and for the sake of conscience. I mean the other's conscience, not your own. For why should my liberty be subject to the judgment of someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why should I be denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Love this passage. Again, what's the topic? Food sacrifice to, to idols. Paul's saying here, clearly, basically, considerate love is more important than your sense of liberty. You know, if someone puts this food in front of you, eat it. Hang out with them. Have a nice meal. If someone puts a food in front of you and says, you know what? This food was sacrificed to idols. Then don't eat it. Why? Because it might cause them trouble in their heart and in their conscience. Like you, they know you're a Christian. And if you're eating this food, it may be a stumbling block to them. This is what he's saying. Whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God, verse 31. He goes, give no offense. When you have the opportunity to be offensive, don't be offensive. What a concept. Verse 33, I love not seeking my own advantage, but that of many so that they may be saved. Again, what's Paul's main motivation? People going closer to Jesus, not farther away. Now... Dun, dun, dun. Here we go into chapter 11. Paul in chapter 11 turns to these three big topics and we'll touch on each of them in our remaining time. Uh, and these are all topics that relate to worship. Wearing a veil, the Lord's Supper, and spiritual gifts. If you dare, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2 to verse 16. Pray for me as I try and explain this to you. I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions just as I handed them on to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the husband is the head of his wife and God is the head of Christ. Any man who prays or prophesies with something on his head disgraces his head. 
but any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled disgraces her head. It is one and the same thing as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not veil herself, then she should cut off her hair. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or to be shaved, she should wear a veil. For a man ought not to have his head veiled, since he is the image and reflection of God, but woman is the reflection of man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. For this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man or man independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through woman, but all things come from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head unveiled? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is degrading to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is to her glory? For if, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone is disposed to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Clear? Great, we can move on. Just kidding. Okay, what the heck is going on here? Let's break it down. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is talking about the confluence of two things, the created order, Adam and Eve, and the customs of the culture in the time and place of the church in Corinth. You just got to know that what Paul is addressing here is an individual problem particular to a unique place and time. Paul is not being prescriptive for all time about head coverings and veils. Uh, so if you're wearing a baseball hat, guys, don't worry. If you don't have a veil on, ladies, Jesus loves you. Are you with me? Say yes. What's he talking about? Adam and Eve, he says, uh, are mutually created, mutually interdependent. Uh, Adam, uh, Adam, Eve came from Adam uh, and they are mutually independent of each other. What, where they got into trouble was when Eve uh, left Adam and acted on her own and Adam acted on his own and sin came into the world. Uh, Adam and Eve in the garden represented perfect humanity before the fall. Um, another thing you should know is that uh, um, the idea back then in the time of the church in Corinth uh, for a woman's head to be uncovered uh, meant that they were loose or unclean. You can still see that in certain cultures and religions today. This is true amongst many orthodox and devout um, Muslims that women need to keep their head covered. Uh, such was the case back then. Uh, I think it's particularly interesting, verse 10, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority of on her head because of the angels. What Paul is saying there is like, uh, this is a spirit. These are spiritual things I'm talking about, um, and it's spiritual reasons why I'm lifting this up. Verse eleven: uh, In the Lord, woman is not independent of man, or man independent of woman. Do you believe this? Yes. Um. We need each other, uh, and especially, I think, he's talking about men's uh, women and men's relationships to each other, and clearly, like, a marital relationship here, too. Like, I'm not independent of Lori, and Lori isn't independent of me. So it ought to be. Verse 14, uh, doesn't not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is degrading to him? Man, I can't stand to have my hair long, so I can relate to this. I don't know how some dudes... Like, no, I, and honestly, ladies, I don't know how you do it. Like, if I, my hair gets below, like, the top of my shoulder, ugh, I, I, could, I just couldn't do it. It'd be hard. But what Paul is saying here is not, for all time, a judgment on long-haired people. Uh, what he's saying is, you don't need to adorn yourself. What you really need is Jesus. Um, again, Adam and Eve, Adam's relationship to Eve, men and women's interdependent upon each other. 
uh, and this this problem in the Corinthian church is um, about this loss of community, the loss of interdependence, and the loss of really keeping the central thing, the lordship of Jesus. So it's not about adorning yourself. It's about, are you connected to the Lord? Again, we got to move. 17 to 22. And from at verse 17, he turns to the away from the issue of veils now to the Lord's Supper. Uh, this is particularly interesting to you, Episcopalians. Now, in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for, you, for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper. And one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. Paul here introduces the problem. Uh, the problem that the church of Corinth has of the Lord's Supper. Again, it might be helpful for you to know that um, the way they were keeping the Lord's Supper certainly wasn't in little prepackaged wafers in a little cup on an altar. This actually meant sharing a meal together. So that may be helpful for you to know as you read this passage. And he's saying, verse 18, that there's factions inside the church. And I think it's interesting, verse 19, it says, For there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. That's true. Factions inside of a church will clarify some things. Right? Uh, about, about who really has the heart and mission of the church in their heart and in their life. Who really is, um, who's committed to Jesus. Um, you know, I've seen church folks fall out over all sorts of different sort of stuff. And uh, it's very interesting to watch what factions and what fault lines emerge inside of a church that's in conflict and uh, and how people behave. And I agree with Paul. It says it's very revealing when factions in a church emerge. And Paul says, for all this, I do not commend you. Uh, uh, and, and what's happening in verse 21 and 22 is he's saying that there are wealthy people that come and they eat their food first and the poor people that are among you, and Paul makes it clear earlier that there are poor people in the church in Corinth, says they could even go hungry. And some of you rich folks, that you're showing up drunk to church. I mean, what's the deal with that? He goes, um, uh, or you show contempt, verse 22, you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing. This is not commendable practice. Verse 23, after he introduces the problem, he teaches about the meaning of the Lord's Supper. Let's look, say, 23 to 26. Let's read that. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night would, when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This language may be super familiar to you, right? It's quoted pretty directly in our Eucharistic prayer language, especially in Eucharistic prayer A. He's teaching the heart of the meaning of the Lord's Supper. Uh, I love it. When he had given thanks, he broke it. In a similar way, Jesus was broken for us. Uh, his body broken. His The cross is redemptive for us. And he's saying, do this in remembrance of me. Twice he says this, verse 24 and verse 25, for the bread and the cup. Because he says, keep the cross, the brokenness of Christ in focus. This is quite a, different from what was happening as the Corinthians were sharing their meal when they gathered. 
He goes, this cup is the, look at this, verse, verse 25. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, pointing to the new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied about in Jeremiah 31 through 34, where the law is not written on a tablet, but the law is written in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Verse 27, let's go to verse 32. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Again, after teaching the meaning of the Lord's Supper, now he's going on to here are the proper manners that you must have in relationship to the Lord's Supper. He warns about people who eat and drink of the cup in an unworthy manner. Uh, uh, this has tripped a lot of people up, this verse. Let's think about it. Who among you, including me, is worthy to receive the Lord's Supper? Nobody. The very act, the very reason why we have the Lord's Supper is because we're not worthy. We need redemption. We need forgiveness. Uh, none of us can measure up. So what could Paul be meaning here? What he means by an unworthy manner is if you, are, if you have this division in your heart, that he's talking about. <clears throat> if you're bringing to the Lord's Supper um, factions, uh, elevating yourself over others, that's the unworthiness that, he, that he's speaking of here. He goes, examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink the cup. You know, this is why we have the confession of sin before we receive the Lord's Supper and not after. Uh, I, I pray that you will do that. Um, like take a moment and take inventory of yourselves. Why? Verse 29, for all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink against themselves. What does he mean? Discerning the body, discerning the body of Christ, the broken body of Christ, but also the, the body of Christ, the church, your connection to your place in the church. So what he's saying is, before you come and receive communion, think about yourself. Think about God, Jesus broken for you, and think about how you fit into the body of Christ and how and what you're doing to help the body of Christ discern the body. Verse 30, yikes. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill and some who have died. God is serious about this. Verse 31, for if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. Again, that's confession, self-examination. Um, God is, look, verse, verse 32, but when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Listen, God is not vindictive. God's not just like looking for some, for you to fall in this so he can get you. No, he wants you to self-examine, repent, have an open heart, and come and receive the Lord's Supper. That's what he wants. Uh, seeking to add to the church and not take away from it. Let's uh, end with the last two verses of chapter 11, verse 33 and 34. Here, Paul says, here, after leaving the topic of your manners, now he's saying, here's how to do it properly. Verse 33, so then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Ah, love that, right? If you are hungry, eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for your condemnation. Don't make a pig of yourself at church, at the Lord's Supper, he says. About the other things, I will give instructions when I come. All right, we've made it to our final section, chapter 12. Uh, very interesting uh, passage. Paul's picking up the third topic in worship. We've done veils, we've done the Lord's Supper, now we're doing spiritual gifts. Chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. 
Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are very varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. Okay. You gotta know, I'm a believer in the spiritual gifts. I'm a not-so-recovering charismatic. So I take, I've always taken this teaching right at its face value. I'm not trying to uh, skirt around this stuff. I think that all of these things, these gifts of the Spirit, are something that you can have, that I can have, that anyone can have because the Holy Spirit is alive and works in us. Let's see what Paul means. He's saying, first of all, again, He's writing in reaction to what he's heard about the church. So there's some, there's some wacky stuff going on around spiritual gifts at the church in Corinth. And he's saying to them, these spiritual gifts are not ends to themselves. So we get, spiritual gifts come to us, right? Not so that we, we can make a big show when we gather together in public and say, be impressed with me because I've got this or that spiritual gift. No. He's saying that there's three big differences. There's three things you got to hold forward about the spiritual gifts. First is that there's something that you there you can be in control of them. Verse two, it's not like pagan worship when people when the spirit would just come on people and they would like convulse and you know really act out. It says no, the, these things are given to you by the spirit and you can control them. Two. And every, every spiritual gift will glorify God. Look at verse 3. Um, they're all point back to the Lord Jesus. Uh, and that's the third reason. They're, they glorify Christ and they're all under the lordship of Jesus. Um, so any use of the spiritual gifts where the person isn't in control, where it doesn't glorify the Lord, and it's not under the lordship of Jesus Christ is out of bounds. Uh, what do, else do I want to tell you about this? Um, there are varieties of, look at verse four, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Uh, does the spirit give every gift to everyone the same? No, but there, how many spirits are there? One. How many gifts are there? A lot. There are a variety of services, but the same Lord. Who's the Lord? Jesus. Gifts are given by the spirit. These services, uh, uh, all are under the lordship, the one lordship of Jesus, there were a lot of activities, but the same God who activates all of them and everyone. This is a beautiful Trinitarian statement of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that um, activate and give these gifts, these activities, these services in ministry for the building up of the body of Christ and to glorify the Lord Jesus. But how many spirits are there? One. How many lords are there? One. Jesus. How many gods are there? How many fathers are there? One. One God, one Lord, one Spirit, but a lot of gifts and services and activities. Are you with me? Say yes. Verse 7. To each. Yes. Each. That means you. The manifestation of the Spirit. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Love this. Uh, what's a manifestation? It's a manifestation of a Spirit. In other words, it is something that, that comes from the Holy Spirit Gifts of the Spirit, hear me, are not an enhancement of your natural abilities. They come from God. They are a manifestation of the Spirit. They are something you could not have done in your own strength or power. And what are they for? They're for the common good. They're never going to come to hurt someone, to judge someone, to make someone feel bad. 
They're for the common good. Are they going to increase factions amongst you? No, it's for the common good. Uh, I'm going to roll through this list really quick. I could do a whole separate class on just verses uh, 8 through 11, but I'll just want to touch each one quickly and then we'll pray and be done. To one is given the spirit of utterance of wisdom, uh, meaning like it's the Holy Spirit giving you a, an insight of wisdom for a certain situation and your ability to articulate it and share it for the common good. You've probably had this gift before and not known that what it what, what it is. You ever been there like, like I can see this problem. Like God gives you the ability to see, to be to, of wisdom. It's a gift to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. In other words, have you ever, the Holy Spirit can give you insight uh, and, and show you something, uh, help you to know something that you couldn't have known uh, in your own strength or power. Uh, it's like wisdom, but it's, also, but it's also like insight. Like you kind of know something in your knower. I bet you've had this too. To so another faith by the same spirit. I bet you've had this. A gift of faith for a specific reason in time. Like when everyone around you maybe is feeling down, all of a sudden you just have this faith that rises up in you and says, you know what? Everything's going to be okay. We can do this gift of faith to another gifts of healing by the one spirit. Notice this is in the plural gifts of healing. Uh, there's all sorts of different sorts of diseases out there, which require a lot of different sort of gifts of healing. Uh, I invite you to pray for the sick because sometimes God heals. It's just true. I've seen it too many times not to believe this. The gifts of healing to another, the working of miracles, power that overcome the law of nature. To another, prophecy, words of encouragement and of hope that build someone up. You know, have you ever, you maybe have done this to a friend or a family member and said, you've just spoken into someone's life. And as you're speaking it, it's like the, it's like the Holy Spirit comes alongside you and helps you know what to say. To another, discernment of spirits, like the ability to see and know whether something is of God or not. To another, various kinds of tongues. Uh, this is being the ability to speak in um, in a in a kind of a language that isn't of this earth. Uh, and tongues can be for private devotion, in prayer, or public for public display when it's followed by the next gift, the interpretation of tongues. Paul will talk more about this in uh, the next, when we get together next. Uh, the ability to hear someone speak in tongues and be able to interpret what it is they're saying. Those are the gifts of the Spirit, verse 11. All these are activated by how many spirits? One and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. It doesn't come from you, it comes from Jesus, from the Holy Spirit. We did it. Wow, congratulations. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, all the way to verse 12 and 11. These are some hard passages, uh, but we did it. I'm glad you stayed, and if you made it all the way to the end, God bless you. Thanks for sticking in there with me. I hope this has been a blessing. May we pray. Dear Jesus, we love you and thank you, and we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would activate these gifts in us. Uh, help us, Lord, in our church to be a church that honors and glorifies you, that is solidly under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Uh, would you, Jesus, help us in the remembrance of the Lord's Supper, help our receiving of it, Lord, that it may come alive in our spirits, in our hearts, in our bodies. Um, help us, Lord, to be generous and to not seek to lift ourselves up or a faction up within the church, but instead really empty ourselves as Paul encourages us to do so that we might by all means save some. And Holy Spirit, we invite you into our lives. Um, Lord, there'll probably be a time soon where we need a gift from you of wisdom or insight or knowledge or prophecy, um, faith. Lord, would you um, stir those up in us and help us to just uh, always be awake and alive to how you want to gift us and help us uh, to be your people, your witness in the world. 
Uh, we love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this time together, and we pray all these things together in your name. Amen. Thanks, friends, for joining us. Have a great rest of your day today, and remember, God loves you.